Hey guys, Aaron Dorr here with Iowa Gun Owners and our national affiliate, the American Firearms Association, joined with a very special guest today, presidential candidate Vivek Ramaswamy. Mr. Ramaswamy, thank you for your time today on the back of the campaign bus site here in rural Washington County. That's right. We're uh, literally moving on the highway. So if you see the bumps, that's where it's coming from. But uh, yeah, it's good to talk to you. Well, thanks for your time. You know, I, I just want to say before I ask you any of our questions, you know, when President Trump got on the debate stage in 2016, he made for the first time in my lifetime, Republican Party debates entertaining, you know, for the first time. And when he said he wasn't going to debate this cycle, I and many people across the aisle, like, well, there goes the debates. They're going to be boring. So if you've done nothing else, you have kept these debates highly, highly entertaining. Thank you. I'll uh, I'll take that as something, but we're <laughs> we're aiming to do something with that. But uh, we'll keep we'll keep things fun and entertaining while you know doing what needs to get done too. But I, I appreciate that, man. Thank you. No, they've been they've been a lot of fun to watch. So the context of our conversation is on gun rights, and the, the, the Iowa context we have caucuses in. I guess twenty six days from right now. There's a lot. Yep. Uh, at stake when it comes to that process. The national context is we have a president who has just declared open season on the Second Amendment and gun owners in a way that we have never seen in our lifetimes here in this country. And the international context is we have presidents in other countries, Ecuador, uh, Brazil, Argentina, who are opening up gun rights to help combat uh, narco-terrorist based violence. Well, we have President Maduro in Venezuela who bans guns in 2012 and is now murdering his own people. So this is not just a 20th century conversation anymore. We're seeing with our own two eyes what happens to a people who are disarmed. And sadly, our own government now with Joe Biden wants to disarm the American people. Why do you think Joe Biden wants all of us disarmed? Well, I think it goes to the very reason why the Second Amendment exists. I mean, I think that suggests to me they actually understand the Second Amendment, maybe better than some so-called Republicans do. They understand it, they just don't like it. I mean, the Second Amendment exists to protect all the other amendments in the Constitution. So if you have a regime that is fundamentally hostile to free speech, to the free exchange of ideas, to the free exercise of religion, everything you see all the way down, they understand that the Second Amendment is the one amendment that puts teeth into the other ones. I mean, that's really what the Second Amendment was created to do. And so if you want to actually get to the root cause of a people's liberty, you might as well go to their last line of defense. And so I don't think I'm being, you know, hyperbolic or I don't think I'm exaggerating anything. I think that this is a regime that understands it's not just about, you know, some superficial gun violence concern. No, that's just the excuse. I think the reality is this right. is a regime that believes something fundamentally hostile to the U.S. Constitution, fundamentally hostile to free speech. And you know what? You can't have the First Amendment without the second. And that's why they're going after the second one as hard as they are. No, well, very true. Macro question for you. What does the Second Amendment mean to you personally? A lot of people believe it's a collective right given to our government. Some believe that it's an individual right. So what does it mean to you? What is the backdrop of this? And then kind of part two from that, where do these freedoms come from? Do they come from the government, from natural law, from God? So what does it mean and where do they come from as far as you're concerned? Yeah. So what does it mean is it's an individual right. It is the right for us to actually stand as a free people. And it's the security blanket on the rest of our freedoms. That's what the Second Amendment means to me. Now, the way I kind of say it is a people of sheep. And I think we have become a nation of sheep. A nation of sheep breeds a government of wolves. That's what the Second Amendment is about. And so when you have a bunch of individuals who ultimately cannot actually stand for their own rights, that invites governmental overreach. These rights come to us from God. We're endowed by our creator with certain inalienable rights among these life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. We can't pursue, we can't stand for our own life. We can't pursue our own liberty. We cannot pursue happiness unless we have the ability to keep the government at bay. And so the way I think about this is maybe an analogy to the Cold War. In the US and the USSR, there was what you called mutually assured destruction where Neither side was supposedly going to destroy the other because both had nuclear armaments in the Cold War. I think of the Second Amendment as giving us mutually assured destruction between a government and the governed, where the individual citizens who get their rights from God, yes, they come and create a government that we the people create into existence. But the way you keep that government in its lane is by mutually assured destruction, that if the government reaches beyond what it was supposed to, then we, the people, are ultimately armed to stand for our own defenses. 
that's what the Second Amendment is, is all about. I think that's what history teaches us, too. I mean, if all you right. think about the Civil War, right, black Americans didn't get to enjoy their civil rights until actually they enjoyed their Second Amendment rights. Chief Justice Taney, and this is how I explained it to some of my friends on the left who, yeah, some of them have come along, actually, in understanding the point of that Second Amendment. A lot have in the last uh, 18 months. Yes, they have. And, and for good reason, because, you know, the left used to stand for individual liberty and freedom at one point in our history, too. Black Americans, they didn't get the first anti-gun laws that were passed were actually guns that stopped black Americans from owning guns. Yes, Chief they were. Justice Taney, he's the Supreme Court justice in the Dred Scott case that came before the Civil War. It's probably one of the worst Supreme Court cases in our history, which said that black Americans could not be citizens. But if you look at the justification for why the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court said it, it was because it would allow black Americans to own guns. So whether you look at it through the history of civil rights, whether you look at it through the history of our Constitution or our Declaration of Independence or natural law, it's foundational for us to be able to physically protect ourselves against tyrannical overreach. Yeah, you know, that's really what that Second Amendment's all about to me. Well, that's uh, that's a very strong answer. We appreciate hearing that. Another macro question for you. You've been you're doing the full Grassley twice, right? You're doing 99 yeah. counties twice. We've heard of the full Grassley since I was a kid, but I've never heard anybody do it twice in this kind of compressed time schedule. So you've been everywhere. You've been everywhere across the state, the pizza ranches, the libraries, the church fellowship halls, yeah. and you've talked to tons of our members with Iowa gun owners across the state, and I have heard from many of them. And the one question they've asked me above everything else, they say, look, I've heard the guy. I shook his hand. You know, we got a selfie. I love what he says. I don't know where he came from, and I don't know yeah. if he's going to stick by what he says today. How do I know I can trust him? And so I'm just asking you, how would you answer our members who are asking us that question? I mean, the first thing I would say is be skeptical of everybody, of any politician, <laughs> frankly. I mean, I haven't been a politician for very long, but we have a government that has lied to us for a long time. I mean, it could go through the whole litany from COVID-19 to the Hunter Biden laptop to you know, well, how our money's being spent in Ukraine to what happened on January 6th. Sure, I would I would always encourage someone to be skeptical as long as it's genuinely coming from a place of care for the country. Some of right. this ends up being in politics artificial, made up by sure. the super PACs, that I reject. But somebody who's a genuine patriot, who cares about this country and says, hey, this guy wants to come, you know, sit across the table from Xi Jinping and represent me. Can I trust him? And if it's coming from a good place, I'll never begrudge that. But here's what I'll say is, Think independently, form your own conclusions. And one of the ways you form a conclusion, I think is whether I trust somebody or not, is what have they given up to advance their convictions? First of all, actually, I haven't come from nowhere. I wasn't famous, you know, certainly before I ran for president, but look at actually what I have been doing. There are people who come to our events that understand I was the number one opponent of the ESG movement in this country before people even knew who what ESG was. I wrote two out of three books, best-selling books on it, but stepped down from my job as a biotech CEO to do it. I founded a multi-billion dollar company that I led as CEO. And you know what? Seven years in, George Floyd dies. There's a demand that I make a demand, that I make a statement on behalf of Black Lives Matter. Every tech CEO, every biotech CEO was doing it. Most of them sure. didn't mean it, but it was the easy thing to do. Yeah. I refused to, and that came at a considerable personal cost. Multiple advisors to my company resigned. I ended up having to face a choice. Either I could bend the knee or I could step aside and continue to speak my mind freely as a citizen. I stepped aside from my job as a comfortable, you know, very cush job as a biotech CEO of a company that I had built as a multi-billion dollar company to stand for my convictions. Think about the positions I'm taking on this race, right? Think about the carbon capture pipeline. I mean, that's a different constitutional right. Relates to the Fifth Amendment, not the Second Amendment. One. I'm the only candidate in this race, the only one on or off that debate stage, by the way. OK, any not not a single one. DeSantis, Trump, Haley, you name it. I'm the only candidate who's able to actually say that that is an unconstitutional overreach using eminent domain to use the land of farmers. Yep. That's a violation of property rights. Why am I the only candidate who can say that or that I'll pardon peaceful protesters on January 6th on day one or that the climate change agenda is a hoax because it doesn't have to do with the climate? or that Ron and McDaniel needs to step aside as the failed chairwoman of the RNC. Yes. So all I would say is think about this. Is that earning me greater donations? It is not, as you probably can see. It said I won't get another cent of funding from the RNC. Why can't it that actually named her by name as somebody who needs to step aside? And so I would say at a certain point, a little skepticism is always good, but 
we've got a very important decision to make for the country in about 25, 26 days. Yep. Well, at a certain point, it's not skepticism for the sake of skepticism. Make the right choice. And if you're doing it for the country, then ask yourself why I'm the only candidate in this race, on or off that debate stage, who can even touch these issues. And the bottom line is, if you want somebody who's going to get in there and speak truth to power, then vote for somebody who's going to speak the truth to you. Start with that. And let's have some real talk, too. Right. I know a lot of people supported Trump. I support Trump. I supported Trump. I respect the heck out of the guy. And I've respected him a lot more than everybody else in this race has. They, you know, licked his boot for years and now they're begging him, you know, begged him for money and endorsements. And now they're Monday morning quarterbacking something yep. he said. I'm not that way. I've been respectful of him and his legacy. But think people, they're not going to let him get anywhere near the White House. What are they doing in Colorado, now California? They're not going to let him get within spitting distance of the White House. And even if they do, at a certain point, you start as an outsider, everybody becomes part of the establishment in some way. I'm the outsider now. I'm unconstrained. I mean, <laughs> I think you could probably tell by some of the things I'm saying on the campaign trail <laughs> or on the debate stage. I'm not doing myself any favors with the establishment. They've shut me off mainstream media. Super PAC puppet masters, well, they don't love me. They're paying for paid you know, trash. They've been stuffing people's mailboxes in about me. So all I'd say is do the math yourself and form your own conclusions. But I think I'm the only person who's actually going to be able to face down the deep state and win. I'm the only person who's coming in as an outsider with sharp elbows. Trump brings that and I bring that too. But the only person who also understands the law and the Constitution. And if you're going to swear an oath to the Constitution, you might as well have read it and know something about it. And I think I'm the only person in this race who both brings the outsider mentality, but with that level of understanding of the Constitution including the Second Amendment, which I think I'm a far stauncher supporter of than Trump or DeSantis or anybody else in this race. If you look at positions they've adopted when they have been in positions of leadership, I'm not a guy who tends to budge. And so no one's going to shake me in my constitutional convictions. Good. We're going to ask you some specific questions now on the Second Amendment. Obviously, this is Iowa gun owner, so we're going to have some gun questions for you. But thank you for that answer in particular. My, my entire lifetime, we have almost never seen a president who got sworn in and fought to undo the previous gun control damage done by his predecessors, let alone fight to expand gun rights. And we had a couple of years with President Trump, we had complete control of Congress and nothing yep. happened for gun owners, yep. nothing. That's in fact, true. we had bad things happen during that time. And so of course, Biden has done significant damage in the last couple of years to executive orders and all kinds of other things to our gun rights. So looking forward, you win the election, you're sworn in, you're the guy, you're behind the desk, what is your day one agenda to roll back damage done to our gun rights and protect our gun rights going forward? Yeah, so let's get to some of the small stuff, but the small stuff is big stuff, right? The bump stock ban, a lot of the other nonsense they've rolled out. Those are unconstitutional regulations, and I'll tell you why. Okay, and, and there's an old saying, right? It goes, if you care about somebody, you tell them the truth. If you care about yourself, you tell them what they want to hear. I'm not telling people what they want to hear at all times, but... There's the most important Supreme Court case of our lifetime was West Virginia versus EPA. It came out last year and it says that if a regulatory agency passes a rule that Congress never gave them the authority to pass, then that's actually unconstitutional. In that case, it related to the EPA's regulation of coal miners, but that applies to the ATF. So a lot of the yep. ATF's regulatory rule writing Look at the statute that created the ATF or empowered the ATF. Those statutes did not empower the ATF to do the things they're doing today. That's the constitutional insight is if I'm swearing an oath to the Constitution and the Supreme Court in West Virginia versus EPA has already told us that those rules are unconstitutional, that on day one, I will instruct the agencies to stop enforcing any of those rules because they are yeah. unconstitutional. And on day one, they're null and void. So treat those rules like executive orders. They're not quite executive orders, but treat them like executive orders, which means you can cross them out. So we'll nullify those on day one because I swear an oath to the Constitution. And the beauty of that is I don't need to promise you I will work with Congress to do this, that, or the other thing. No, a lot of this damage was done by the executive branch. It can yes. be undone by the executive branch. Exactly. And are they going to sue me? Yes, they will. We'll take it to the Supreme Court. We win six to three, the same one that gave us West Virginia versus EPA. Now the next president who comes after me can't play ping pong back in the other direction. So that's how we drive change. And ultimately, within the first year, we're actually going to shut down the ATF. 
I think that that agency should not. Oh, uh, you're getting ahead of my next question, but keep going, keep going. No, I, I mean, I mean, I have a whole list of day, of agencies were shut keep down going. in the first year. FBI, IRS, ATF, CDC, Nuclear Regulatory Commission, Department of Education. But one of the constitutional bases for doing it, and again, this is, I'll tell you where I'm different than a lot of the other candidates, but my mentality is you can't reform these bureaucracies. It becomes part of the culture of an agency, right? In the same way a company has a culture, you can't change the culture. As a new CEO, the culture becomes what it is. You can't change the culture of the agency. The ATF as it exists today is fundamentally hostile to the Second Amendment. It's fundamentally hostile to the existence of the Second Amendment. They wish it didn't exist. They don't view it as their right to protect it. They view it as their they view it as a constraint and an inconvenience. And so I think the correct answer is shut it down. A limited function of background checks, move it to the U.S. Marshals. That's what I've said. And the U.S. Marshals have not been corrupted in the same way. But we'll shut down the FBI, the ATF, any agency that has fundamentally abandoned its constitutional purpose or never should have had one in the first place. We're not going to reform it. I'm not going to replace a new agency head. That's not going to do a darn thing. We will get in there and shut it down. And my authority to do so, I'll tell you what it is. It, not, not that anybody's asking, but I'll tell you because you got to know, you know that you're on solid footing. It's the 1977 Presidential Reorganization Act. That's a law that says under certain circumstances, the U.S. president has the authority already from Congress to reorganize the federal government, including if it's to eliminate redundant agencies. So if the U.S. marshals can do it, that means the ATF is redundant. Right. Shut the dang thing down. And that's exactly how I'm going to do it in the first year. Very good. Well, I was going to ask you about H.R. 374. It's a bill that our national affiliate, the American Firearms Association, had filed by Congressman Matt Gates out of Florida, and it would do exactly that. It would abolish the ATF. I was so going to ask if you would Gates sign the this. bill. Go ahead. I've talked to Gates about this, actually. Actually, when I saw him put that up, I, I actually called him up and said I loved what he was doing, but I actually then invited him to a speech that I gave in Washington, D.C., explaining why I, as the next president, could do it even without the bill actually passing. And so... I applaud him for it. That's another way to do it. You could do it through Congress. I just don't think that bill is going to pass. I mean, I think even if Republicans gain control of Congress, I mean, I'm mostly sick and tired of the Republican establishment. I think it is not that much different from the Democratic Party as they try to pretend they are. And that's a discussion for another day. I think the swamp is alive and well in the Republican Party's establishment. In many ways, I think the puppets they're actually trying to put up are actually from the deeper establishment that propped up Biden. Some of the same people are the ones propping up the you know, Nikki Haley's and others of the world in our own party. So I'm not a big Republican versus Democrat guy because I think both parties are corrupt and both parties don't really give a, give a care about the Constitution. But that being said, I, I told Gates that was a good that was a good bill. It's just not going to make it through. So he started, a, you know, it was a good conversation. He's starting in Congress. But all I need is to get in there as the U.S. president. We get that done using existing constitutional authority. And so that's the kind of president I'm going to be. Stand for the Constitution. Don't apologize for it. If you want to sue me, take me to the Supreme Court. We have the best Supreme Court we've ever had in my lifetime. We'll codify that into judicial precedent. Yep. That's how we drive change in this country. Perfect. All right. Next question is the National Firearms Act. As I'm sure you know, the National Firearms Act of 1934, it's not so much a law it's a shoebox. And anytime a president wants to attack our gun rights, he opens up the shoebox of the National Firearms Act. He signs an executive order. You mentioned bump stocks. We've seen it with pistol braces, with all kinds of things. They bypass Congress, never have a vote in the Congress, and they expand the list of items that are regulated and or controlled or banned by the National Firearms Act and say that they're suddenly illegal. So we have a bill right now in Congress, H.R. 450, with Congressman Burleson from Missouri, that would repeal the entirety of the National Firearms Act. Many people believe this is too extreme. Our members love it. If you're president and that bill gets to your desk someday, would you sign a repeal of the National Firearms Act? Yes, I would. I'm familiar with this issue, largely because I think the way it's been interpreted and applied, and arguably then the law itself, is unconstitutional. Right? The highest law of the land is the U.S. Constitution. The laws are passed pursuant to the Constitution. Congress can't, by statute, roll back constitutional protections, especially those guaranteed in the Bill of Rights. And so I think there's actually the harder question, which I actually come down in favor of, is you could say the president cannot enforce a law that is unconstitutional in its nature. That's part of what swearing an oath to the Constitution entails. But I think the cleaner way to do it would be to repeal. And yes, I would favor it. Okay, very good. 
Uh, next question. Our neighbors in Illinois this year, as well as in Washington State, uh, suffered a huge blow to their gun rights where their governors banned the sale of the very popular AR-15. As I'm sure you've been all over Iowa. You've probably seen some ARs in the back of some guy's yeah. trucks. Maybe you've autographed some. Maybe you've shot some. This is the yeah. number one tool. Yeah. There you go. That we uh, pr that we like as gun owners to stop tyrants, to stop criminals, and for all around use. This is now, of course, the number one agenda item of this president is to yeah. ban the sale of them nationally. This is their top agenda. Going forward, you're in the White House. You have a Democrat-controlled Congress, let's just say, and that bill gets to your desk. You will promise, I, I presume, to veto any attempt to ban AR-15s, correct? I mean, look, if I'm going to... If I'm going to sign into law something that repeals the National Firearms Act, what do you think I'm going to? Yeah, of course, I'm going to veto that. I mean, there's no there's no question. Fair question. I mean, there's a lot of Republicans these days who are waffling this issue right now. And now, so a I lot mean, of guys want to hear. I, I mean, as somebody who owns an AR-15, somebody, yeah, people. And, and I get people who are skeptical. Somebody, somebody to challenge more. What does AR-15 stand for? I said it stands <laughs> for freedom, actually, yeah. because that's what it stands for. So that's that's as simple as that. Very good. Red flag gun seizures is a hot topic right now here in Iowa and across the country. You know, last year, Joe Biden convinced dozens of congressional Republicans, including our own Joni Ernst right here in Iowa, to sign a bill to give the DOJ $750 million to be used to bribe states. They call it incentivize. We all know it's a bribe. The states into passing red flag laws. It's a hot topic in Iowa. It's a hot topic in D.C. Many Republican rhinos support this across the country. If a future Congress, Republican or Democrat, puts any form of red flags on your desk, would you veto or sign that bill? And before I let you answer that question, the context as I'm sure you know, is that a red flag law allows your guns to be seized through secret ex parte hearings before you've been convicted of a crime in a court of law. So I'm dead set against the red flag laws, which are basic constitutional abuse. That's what they are. They've been abused to effectively remove guns from law abiding citizens. You want to know the right answer to deal with violent crime? Move psychiatrically ill and dangerous people from their communities. Don't remove guns from law abiding citizens especially to do it extrajudicially. We're not even talking about a conviction in the court of law. We're talking about somebody just deciding that somebody calls in a red flag, the police can basically remove right. it from your home. That's wrong. And this isn't a red versus blue state question anymore. Even Florida, I mean, this is Ron DeSantis, who in many ways was a good governor in the state of Florida. There have been about 800 removals of guns from law-abiding citizens under Ron DeSantis's own tenure in the state of Florida. So I don't mean this as a personal criticism of Ron, but it's a good example of even in a so-called hard red state with an otherwise good Republican governor, somebody who's going to go soft when it actually matters in protecting the Second Amendment. And so I won't go soft. I mean, that's the bottom line answer. I'm against red flag laws, which are rife for abuse. Remove psychiatrically ill and dangerous people from their communities if they put them in mental health institutions. Don't remove guns from law abiding citizens. That's what I say. Oh, very good. Final question. We asked our members other questions to ask you. The one I was told above many, actually, was the United Nations UN Small Arms Treaty. This has been a topic for the left for a very long time. Joe Biden made America a signatory of the treaty when he got back in the White House. As I'm sure you know, it would establish a global firearms uh, registry process that would track the end user of every gun owner in the country of the world and it would subject ultimately our gun rights here in iowa and, and across the country to china and and, and dictators across the globe uh, i assume i know the answer to this question but I, you're not going to let america be swept up into the u.n small arms treaty as president correct hell no is the answer to that question and this is part of a broader assault on our liberties more generally you know think about the rise of a transnational central bank digital currency. You know, think about the rise of the global ESG movement that comes from some of the same globalist sources that effectively are using the back door to even stop lending funds to firearms manufacturers or otherwise. I stand against that imposition on our national sovereignty. It's true. Other countries don't love that the United States has a Second Amendment. Well, too bad. That's who we are as Americans. Yeah, That's our choice and not yours as the U.N., and actually, that's one of the many reasons why I've said that we're not going to participate in funding the U.N. on my watch. If you have an institution that's hostile to our own sovereignty from the WHO to the U.N., I'm sorry, we're not using our taxpayer dollars to pay for it. And if that means the U.N. ceases to exist, I'm perfectly fine with that. I think the Human Rights Council of the U.N. is staffed by Venezuela, North Korea, other countries like that. 
that's a joke. It's an institution yeah. that's abandoned itself and lost its way. We shouldn't be bending the knee to them. We should not be bending the knee to them in any way. And so that's where I land on that question. And you know, there's, there's just a couple, like one other important topic that's sort of related to this because it relates to the ESG movement that's an international phenomenon too. This is where the puck is going with respect to restrictions on gun rights. It's not just from the government. They're effectively using financial institutions. I mean, this is yes. sort of was Operation Choke Point, a ver was a version of this. But they're using financial institutions to effectively stop lending to or buying the stocks of gun manufacturers or others to accomplish through the back door what the government couldn't do through the front door under the Constitution. And I wrote about that in my most recent book, Capitalist Punishment. But I think it takes a president who understands that because the other side historically has always been one half step ahead and we're always playing from behind. I think it requires a class of a Republican leadership that's actually one step ahead instead, isn't just skating to where the puck is on those constraints and those assaults on the Second Amendment, but skating to where the puck is going. And I think the people of this country deserve that. That's part of why I'm in this race. I see that as missing in the Republican Party, a party that's become very reactive to what the left does, as opposed to standing for our own values and being ahead of the curve. And so anyway, that's where I'm at on on a lot of these questions, even that, that we didn't talk about. And hopefully at least that gives you a sense for how I think about things. So you asked me about the U.N. imposing its will on the United States. No, we say hell no to that. But I look at it the other way. We should be proud of our Constitution and our ideals, and maybe we export them to our allies. So if we talk a lot about one of the top issues the next president faces is deterring a Chinese invasion of Taiwan. And I've developed a comprehensive deterrence strategy. But one element of that deterrence strategy is let's export our Second Amendment to Taiwan, turn Taiwan into a porcupine. If you put an AR-15 in every Taiwanese house to train them how to use it, that'll actually make Xi Jinping think twice before ever invading that island. Because keep in mind, that's what the Second Amendment was designed to do in the first place. Absolutely. In the U.S., keep foreign autocrats at bay. If it works here, there's no there's no rule that can only work here either. And so... Maybe that's something that your group could could you know, and I'd work with you guys if you were interested in doing it. Turn that well, it's second right, It's happening right now in it. Israel. You know, Israel Absolutely. of course was sadly disarmed. It's a perfect and, example. Uh, after the attacks, they're now passing out thousands of AR-15s across their country. Yep. So it's not just an American ideal. An armed population obviously is the best deterrent to um, international in invasion or to uh, domestic uh, tyranny. So it's a great yeah. idea. Thank you again for your time today, Vivek. Travel safely, and uh, all the best to you on uh, caucus night. Thanks, man. We'll talk soon. Thank you.